Welcome to the second episode of It's Personal, an entrepreneur's podcast. We know that oftentimes people say that it is not personal, it's just business, but we know that's not true here and that every entrepreneur has a personal story of sacrifice, wins, losses, failures, and that's what this podcast is all about. So today, let's get right into it. We got myself, Kurt, Andrew McKelvey. And Mike, also known as Crazy Mike, back to host. And we have our special guest with us here today, which is our in-house contractor, Michael McKelvey of Michael McKelvey Homes, also known as Andrew's father. And uh, we're going to get right into it from there. He's known Um, for a lot more than just being my father. Uh, I said also known. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, I think, you know, thanks for being with us, number one. Uh, We're really happy to have you here in the office and be on the podcast. I guess I would just really start by saying, walk us through a little bit about how you even started doing contracting, your your path leading up to that, some other things in your history, and just your path to contracting in general and when you started. Great. Thank you, Kurt. Glad to be here. Um, It is a journey. Uh, Started 20 some odd years ago. Uh, I was on a different school, education path, different vocational career path. Sure. And, um, you know, you get to the point where you're, you know, you believe you're a grown man and make your own decisions. I felt like the previous decision was more of my mother's dream for my life than my dream for my life. Yep. And, uh, I, with that previous dream, I was on a different, you know, path of study and, a you know, undergraduate degree and even a graduate degree. And, um, and I kind of st- stumbled into, or, well, not stumbled into, I planned my way into contracting, uh, some 20 years ago, uh, me and my family, Andrew being present in the room was a part of this journey. We were in, uh, Southwest Georgia and, um, I came to a point where I had an opportunity Really kind of when you're young and you find your way in, I, I became a superintendent for a home builder in uh, South Georgia. Yep. And uh, he was developing a neighborhood similar to what we may do in the future, uh, building houses uh, and, and selling those houses. Um, then, you know, a few years later, I had an opportunity to uh, transition to South Florida. Or I'm sorry, not South Florida, Northwest Florida, here in the Panhandle. Um, went to work for an Atlanta builder managing projects. And that was kind of in the the watercolor area, correct? Yeah, 30A, you know. Before it was uh, really like a big a big thing like it is now. Gosh, back in the day we were building phase one. Phase one watercolor. Yeah. Right that's there crazy. at the town center. Phase one watercolor. I mean, it's it's a huge conglomerate now. When you first got into contracting back like being a superintendent did you think it was going to be something that you were going to do forever at that point in time yes yeah i did you you knew that it was what Uh, you wanted to do you know i i had uh quite a few years with with monty um in 30a watercolor area yep um then monty you know much like you know at least the other three young men in this room you know you have families and kids Monty had a very tragic occurrence in his life where his young yep. baby daughter uh, got sick unexpectedly and actually passed away. And Monty, and again, talking about personal, I mean, that's the personal journey. Yeah. Monty's primary business was in Atlanta. He backed out of this area, this area. And he, he gave me the opportunity. He said, Michael, you can have, you can have it. You can take it over. And Monty was a really a great mentor and a visionary. And that's where I branded my company with my name. Yep. Michael McKelvey Holmes. And uh, talk about personal. I mean, yeah, no, you, to you be honest, hide. something a lot of people might not realize is when we were trying to come up with the name for the podcast, this exact story was something that we were talking to you about in passing when you were passing the room and it kind of helped formulate 
how we even came up with the name for the podcast because when you were naming your company you felt yeah. like it was personal and you we put your name on it we talked about that and that was really the precipice for us even coming up with the name of the podcast so and so when i took over you know that was the beginning of michael McKelby holmes and uh you know that's been you know a part of my life for a long time you know here in the panhandle we had you know bp oil spill years ago you know in the market oh nine crashed crashed and went away well I yeah no nine you know i mean the, the timing of that situation even with monty's uh, daughter's situation like you said it showed that it was really personal even his wife said you know don't want to be a part of that anymore so they moved out of florida um well, the memories were here. The memories, yeah. Not, the whole, I mean, not, it's, it's, it's not necessarily memories, the business. Yeah, it wasn't the, the business memories. side of it. It was the personal memories, the going back to that neighborhood, uh, which led to that opportunity. Um, but it shows that it all ties in, whether whether it's the professional side of your life or the personal side of your life. The personal decisions and the, the things that happen in your personal life definitely have an effect on what you're doing in Ab- business. Absolutely. I mean, you yeah, can try to I separate agree. the two, but there is... Uh, emotional overlap between the two, no, no matter what. Yeah, and when you try to build something, no matter how it comes about, um, it becomes kind of like a part of you, both through like a time commitment uh, and a financial commitment and, and other parts. So you have to be able to separate the two things in execution, but it's like we were talking about this morning. You have to plan those two things out, and they have to coincide in a way at, at the same time. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it really is uh, – business to me is, you know, it is – all personal it's about how you can mesh your life with your professional journey and make it something that's your own that that allows you to put focus on both areas of life i I think a key element of that whole story in life in general is opportunities arise out of tragedy and they help define us as a person and really help you know define our story uh, in business and in life so and and although i would say in the moment almost impossible to see it the best it's kind of like you know the story of the phoenix truly like the best things come out of the worst things and i'll 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 even like reflect you know uh when andrew and i were running the franchise restaurant like that was one of the hardest times of my life stress wise even financially but i can tell you like what i learned through that process about like digital marketing people management myself even um how to manage risk what i do want to spend time on what i don't I, i mean i really can't I couldn't have taken any course or class or degree to figure out those things, right? So I, I, the hardest things, the worst things, the lowest points often lead to the, like, the greatest pastures, in my opinion, even though it's very hard to see in the, in, yeah, in the, in the moment. In the moment. Yeah. yeah. Easier said than done. Yeah. The journeys of life. Yeah. Yep. And it's all intermingled. So um, getting back to, to, to you and, and, and Michael McKelvey Holmes, uh, you know, as a contractor – I think we all in this room have a pretty good understanding of, of what that job looks like and what it entails. But I think sometimes um, maybe like the general public or the general populace doesn't know exactly what exactly that entails. And they have kind of like a realtor. People don't really know what realtors do day to day. They yep. just think we show up and make a 6% commission, <laughs> um, uh, which is far from the truth. But so why don't you kind of talk to us a little bit about for the general, the, the, the layman, you will, that doesn't deal with the types of things we deal with. You know, what is it that you do day to day as a contractor? Um, and what is it about that that you enjoy? Well, uh, the best thing I enjoy about what I do is building for clients, building for homeowners, uh, whether the homeowners are a part of the project at the very beginning. But we're building homes. Sometimes the, the occupants, the homeowners, you know, come into an existing project, uh, maybe even a finished project. Sure. But you all, my vision is always a family and a home. Yep. Um, you know, and then, you know, their life experience that are going to be in the, you know, homes that, that I build, you sell, you know, we all, you know, conduct business over. It's personal. It's their life as well. There's just Uh, something about, creating a product that you know people are going to create memories in lifelong yeah and also it may be the most expensive asset these people ever buy so there's like a pride in making sure you know it's built well and it's a space that people can enjoy Um, because the truth is a home is the most expensive asset a lot of people will 
purchase and they're going to spend a bulkhead of their time with their family in that space too. Yep. Yeah. On a pre-construction contract, you know, we're, you know, when I would build for a client in the very beginning, you know, as you approach the phases of construction, uh, when you get the house dry down, you start doing the interior finishes. There's a press from the family to always get a commitment for completion around a holiday. Yeah. You know, it might be Fourth summer July, vacation, whatever. might be Fourth of July, it might be Thanksgiving. Might whatever be, that next might holiday Might be the first is. Christmas in their new house. Yeah. Uh, well, whatever. they always want it to be Fourth of July when they really know that the deadline probably should be Labor Day, right, right. <laughs> but but they want they want to push that extra thirty or forty five days faster. You know, yep. they that want makes memorial, sense. They want Memorial Day when it probably should be Fourth of July, um, and that and that's where when you're working with that client, yeah, but then it's really gonna be Labor Day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, don't we all just want our dreams to be realized sooner, the day, earlier, yeah. faster yeah. than expected? You know, that's, I think it's human. Well, nature. And that's expectation setting, yeah. and, and just you know, staying, and, and that's the part of it's personal. That's the part of naming it Michael McKelvey Homes. Um, you know, we won't have to get into particular builders and stuff, but you know, uh, us <clears throat> here, at least in my opinion, you know, Hurricane Michael, twenty eighteen. Hundreds of contractors flooded our area, but none of them had a business that was named after them or that you could track back. You know, they all started these LLC shell companies yep. and they hid behind them for 18 months and did a bunch of really, really bad work um, and really affected families more than they benefited them. I mean, even my wife's family. Uh, they spent three and a half years dealing with insurance and yep. four different contractors and, yep. and lawsuits back and forth. And, uh, you know, here we are five, almost six years later, and they, they, they basically just now getting things settled and are going to get their kitchen redone. And we're talking about something that was five and a half years ago. And they've been dealing with it ever since because they initially hired a contractor who was hiding behind a shell name and did really yep. lousy work. And they ended up having to do all the same work three times in a row to get it done. And so that's that's what I believe is important about it being personal and it being labeled right here. I mean, my last name is McKelvey. You know, I mean, I may not be Michael, but, but my last name is McKelvey. So in my opinion, my representation and my reputation is, is on that shirt as well. So, so delivering a quality product that a family can enjoy and, and, and enjoy the product, not fix the product as soon as they move into it. Yeah, and I think, honestly, that's a pretty common thing just in general. I think, you know, you could say this almost about any profession, but contracting especially, there's like two ends of the spectrum. There's people who just shouldn't be doing it and people who should. Uh, and there's just really no in yeah. between mm -hmm. on that. There's not no okay contracting work. <laughs> it's yeah. just it's just bad or good. And unfortunately, I think there's more bad ones than good ones. And uh, you know, I I unfortunately I think people experience that a lot, especially after the storm here locally and in situations like that. So when you do have a good contractor and somebody that knows what they're doing and has had the experience, built luxury, built non-luxury, uh, different climates, places in the country. It's very valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's just, it just goes without saying. So like, uh, let's talk a little bit too. You were in the Cayman Islands for a while building homes. Talk to us a little bit about that. What kind of stuff you were building and, uh, what, you know, what that looked like, what, what were the values of these homes? How big were they? What kind of finish work were you doing? Yeah. Well, I had a transition, you know, in, in my personal journey and, and, career where I did have an opportunity to go to the Cayman Islands, uh, in 2013. Okay. Uh, I believe it was. And, um, uh, it was, you know, it's a real odd occurrence the way it happened. Even that opportunity developed, uh, met someone here in Florida Yeah. at a, uh, tailgate. In Tallahassee at an FSU football game. 13 and 0, undisputed national champions. <laughs> <laughs> Don't care what the college football right. playoffs say. It's a hot uh, topic right now. And uh, I met this guy that was hosting the tailgate, huge FSU tailgate. We got acquainted throughout the day, and he was a project manager in the Cayman Islands. I mean, honestly, I feel like that's how you find most opportunities or gigs it's like when you're not looking for even like even a girlfriend or marriage mm -hmm. a job whatever <laughs> it's just when you you're at the tailgate the bar they get together yep that's pretty someone. cool though yeah and uh had an opportunity to join a uh, 
contracting firm, home building firm down there. Um, you know, and it's was not altogether different from what I built out on 30A. You okay. Know, the luxury homes, you know, in, in this area, uh, they're just surrounded by water where, you know, we have the water on one side. Right. But yeah. Again, yeah. some some beautiful, substantial homes, you know, two, three story homes, it's all about getting the view and the the elevation. What was like the value of these homes? You think what were they? What were what were these homes costing oh, people? Oh gosh, five, six, seven million dollars. What about yeah. that Foster's family one that I I remember when I came and visited? You were working on the the Foster. I think that was their name. Yeah. The grocery store. I think I may have even seen that on the video yeah. chat. At it one was point. like you were showing us like the round entryway. It's or like something three like separate that. buildings. Yeah, the on Foster one family was a, a, a grocer. In, in the Cayman Islands, the uh, the predominant they're the Winn Dixie of the Cayman they're Islands. They're the Winn Dixie of the Cayman, Cayman Islands. Yeah. Uh, sure, groceries are real cheap on an island. Or, but yeah. again, <laughs> they, they have their name on the company. It's Foster's Food. Yeah, Fair. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they're huge in the island. You yeah, know, business wise and and very well known. How big was active. that house? You think? Well, there were three houses. There was one okay. main house, it's like a compound. Yeah, it was it was a compound. Uh, you know, right on, right on the Caribbean Ocean, Caribbean Sea. Uh, there was one main house, four bedrooms, big living space. Uh, then we had a separate cottage built for their mother. Uh, their their father, David Foster, has had passed away, but and the second generation was taking on the business. But the mother was still active. Gotcha. We had a cottage for the mother. That was mom's was house. completely separate. That was structure. on the left side. The the family house was in the middle the other was on the left and then on the right hand side there was a you know thousand square thousand square foot outdoor kitchen uh with with mm. full open you know panda doors around all the that's crazy yeah, i just remember there was like one table that was big enough to hold what it was like some ridiculous number it was like 20 people oh you could yeah there's like one see, shotgun table down this line of this shit. Well, they kitchen. had three generations of family that were going to gather. That were going to live gather at this house. Yeah. So you've got Cayman oh. Islands building compounds, five six million dollar homes. What were the homes in watercolor at the time going for that you were building, and how big were those? Oh, and and phase one back in the day. I mean, y'all know the real estate. The real estate is is multiplied. Yep. By a lot. By yeah. a lot. Uh, I mean, these were so because this was in 2013. No, no. Watercolor all started, what, uh, 2003 is when you started working yeah. down here. Okay, so yeah, like in 2003 yeah. when you first started phase one, what were those homes selling for? Oh, gosh. Uh, two million, three million. I mean, they were always... Yeah, always, but know, I mean, they're probably, homes, they're probably but double that They're now. probably yeah. 10 yeah. now. Oh, yeah, yeah those yeah. phase one homes uh, out there close to the beach club now. Yeah, those are Just to give perspective, million. now it's 2023, they're probably 8, 9, 10. They're probably, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the comps yeah. on those now. 6, yeah. 7, 8, uh, 9, 10. I mean, it just depends on the finishes and the size. Yeah. Do they have a carriage house on the back of them? You know, there was a few different options, but... Yeah, yeah. a little shameless plug, I guess you would say, but I've been impressed by your portfolio, your, your range of work. Where can somebody go out and find, you know, some pictorials or ideas of your work and your history? Well, I mean, we all have social media. Yeah. They can find my website at mckelveyhomes.com. Okay. And, I, and I'll, I'll pause for just a moment to, you know, describe the transition from Michael McKelvey Homes. And that, that is still, you know, sure. the, the proper name for my company. But uh, my website, I dropped the Michael, and we've, you know, our, our site is McKelveyHomes.com. Because now, you know, the business involves more than just Michael. Sure. Uh, namely, Andrew. Yep. And, uh, you know, I want him, you know, you are involved in some amazing things. And he's got the ownership in my company as well. Yep. Uh, as as it would go. And I think, uh, the, you know, as far as like our current rehabbing business and flipping business, um, you know, also, I guess I'll, I'll steal this from Mike shameless plug here, but Andrew is extremely organized and on top of the ball, um, and gets those projects done very quickly with little to no, no help from anyone else. And, um, we, we didn't, we didn't, he didn't have someone telling him, Hey, this is what you need to do. We just figured it out. You I know, hope that's because he watched his and, dad uh, for so. But many I was years. gonna say <laughs> it's tra it's apparent because um, you know Mike and I know some. 
Mike more than me. I'm not a work with my hands type of guy. Everybody knows that. Um, but you know, if you point, tell me to pick that up, I can do it. I'm not afraid of work, <laughs> but I don't think you want me building anything. Um, but the truth is, is that it's apparent how high his knowledge level is from working with you growing up. And, uh, he's, he's very well versed at what he does. So, you know, testament well, to that. I mean, he walked, he walked my jobs. It's like punch tape, tag you know, along. come in, come in soon. Punch tape for yeah. a job site near you. Uh, yeah. it's, it's you, you've never punched out a job before until you've punched out a job with Michael McKelvey. Yeah. I punched out a job with you and I know that there was yeah. a lot of stuff that I wouldn't have taped, yeah. but well, we just blue, blue tape, blue tape. Yeah. 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 You can. Stick here, stick so here. here's the thing is, you know, it's so irritating to tape, tear the blue tape and all that stuff. And then you only have one color. What I'm saying, what I'm proposing is we make different colors and they're pre little, pre sized little stickers with a non sticky corner and we sell it as punch tape. So people punch can go do tape. punch out, yeah. you know, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> red, yellow, and green. Yeah. Red, perforated. Green. Yeah. Red must be fixed. Yeah. Perforated already. Coming oh, soon. but they all have to be fixed. Yeah. 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 That's trademark. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the intention is the punch is all punch done tape. before the clients move yeah, into yeah. the house. Um, but I always do a follow up. They're after they get Six in the months, house, one year, whatever. It, it, it's a, it's a follow up. They've used all the appliances. They've opened all the doors. They've opened all the cabinets. They know um, what's rubbing and scrubbing. You and, know, and, they, and generally, there would be a thirty a day list yeah. after they've moved yeah. in. Not not a warranty list. They would have a warranty for a year you know, on the, the structure and the components of their house. But just the fit and finish. Yeah, yeah. We would do an initial punch list before they moved in and a final punch list at 30 days. So you've been contracting for how many years now, would you say? Roughly? 20 years. 20 years. How would you say from like, you know, the last 20 years, what what has changed about the industry the most in your opinion? Uh Well, the sticks and bricks and the finishes of a house have not changed a lot. Uh, you know, our, our hurricane, the, the unseen requirements in construction and, and the progressions of the code, constant basically. building code changes. Yeah. Uh, but most of that's, you know, unseen. The, you, the owners never know Do you know feel like... A lot of how things work, if, like how is check, I guess I would say this too, like how has technology changed contracting and the way it gets done? Because there's been a lot of changes in like, you know, computer software and even how people contact a contractor. How, how has that changed? Very much like every other phase of our life. Yeah. You know, we're driven by our smartphone and our, our uh, you know, Wi-Fi. And mm-hmm. um, so the, the communication is constant. Yeah. You know, just like you guys. Just I like mean, real estate. You know, you're taking else. calls, yeah. uh, you know, all the time. And again, when it's personal, you're not working at office hours. No. Eight to five. Yeah. Somebody calls at eight o'clock at night and they're in one of our houses and they have a problem. You're going to answer the phone. Yeah. Yeah. That's that one of those things that like uh, for anyone who's considering working for themselves, I would just say like you just need to make peace with living on your phone it's it's not always you can have boundaries but like unfortunately in this day and age we're instantly accessible yeah. and that's what a client expects um yeah. so you got to draw some boundary but uh that that was one of the biggest realizations for me because at least at corporate there were times when i could like take my work phone and put it on a drawer right and i was like well if they call i'm not working right I'm but off. that that's not how working for yourself works right because if you guys don't get it done if we don't get it done who gets it done yeah. there, there is no one um so, you know, there's a lot of great things about being an entrepreneur too, but time sacrifice, especially in the early phases, uh, you know, that's probably the biggest one. Yeah. Well, again, these, these homes are occupied by families. Yeah. Just like, you know, yours and mine, you know, and things happen at all hours of the night and, um, that fly. needs to be addressed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. There's a. There's a fly in there. Fly right <laughs> in my face. We he wanted to join the podcast. <laughs> yeah, don't come over here. Um, yeah. So, uh, what about labor? Yeah, labor. What about let's, labor. Let's talk about. I that. feel like that's a big part of contracting. Um, and and him asking what's changed over the last twenty years. That's kind of what popped in my head. Obviously, I haven't been on job sites for twenty years. Well, I have been, but not 
at an old enough age to know what was going on. But I could probably generally assume based off of what's happened in every other industry in the, in the world right now. Um, how do you manage subs? How do you, how do you make progress on a property? How do you get it done in a timely manner? I mean, is that, that seems like that would be, and at least in my experience on, on a flip level and a renovation level, uh, that's one of the biggest hurdles that I have to deal with on a daily basis yeah. is, is getting these guys yeah. in and getting it done in order in a timely manner. Um, and I would say this, like in any business, uh, people, in the absence of people, like it's pretty easy to run a business, right? Like people are what makes business hard. Um, but it, having managed a lot of people on a lot of businesses before, I will say that managing subs well, and contractors, construction, you construction can't. It, you literally it was a total, can't get it done. I mean, no. you literally. I mean, construction. It, it's so is, progressional. It's construction. So one, you have two, to three. see the progress, and you can't get to step six without steps one through five being. And I'm done. just gonna go out and say it: the industry in general, and a lot of the people that work in it are fickle. Yeah. And fly by night, and it's hard labor. It's not easy stuff. So that was a huge learning curve for me. Like managing people at a job site is yeah. completely different than really any other. What's thing. your, what's so. your take on that? Well, you have to manage the expe expectations from the beginning in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, with, with, with our clients, with our homeowners, but also our trade partners. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's, you know, a, a term I like to use versus, subcontractors so, yeah. yeah because they're a partner in what we're doing yeah it's true uh yeah. you know we can't that fly likes you over there we can't get this house finished <laughs> without them without them yeah. yeah um you know and so you choose your trade partners wisely carefully or as wisely as you can miss uh <laughs> you know trade partners that don't over promise now he's got me because when you overpromise, it's hard to deliver. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, real expectations. Real expectations. Tangible, real expectations. And some of those expectations are based on a calendar as well. Because so, we have owners that want to move in. Let me ask you this. How do you, we'll call them trade partners. How do you structure payment for trade partners to keep them motivated, you know, motivated but also not giving them so much they don't show up to the job because I think this is a fine line that a lot of people that do any kind of renovation or construction work yeah. struggle with. There are specific payment milestones in the contract from the very beginning. Yeah, and you have to have you have it on paper from the get-go. Yeah, you got to and that's we've learned that the hard way. Um, yeah, absolutely. You've got to, especially if it's a job that has phases. Um, you know, if you're giving them a scope of work that has two or three different phases of work, um, because we we've done that. I mean, we've yeah. been those guys. The human nature in you wants check. to say like, you know, everyone's trustworthy like I am. Everyone holds himself accountable like I do. Everyone cares, and and the truth of the matter is that's probably not true a lot of the time, some or or subconsciously not true. Some of it's not about trust. It might be about experience. True. Yeah, true. Uh, you know, in being able to get through a project from start yeah, they, to finish. Yeah, on the other end. To punch out. The trade partners have to have belief that we know what we're doing as well, too. Yeah. I mean, that's part of it. So when you're first starting out, I mean, there is a level of like, do these guys know what the hell they're doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean. <laughs> absolutely. Just like any relationship, though, the key element is communication. Yeah. Yep. You build that trust. You have that mutual respect. And you go back to the same sub, trade partners, you know, that have proven themselves in the past. And that's who you reward with your, with your business, the opportunities. There's only two ways to motivate another human being that I've learned through my experience is yeah. pleasure and pain. And the pain of losing a job and not being able to work with you in the future, yeah. that hurts. The pleasure of having some consistent work and, and income for you and your staff is extremely pleasurable yeah. you know? Especially and, when you know and mike you uh you, you've spent some time working on jobs too what 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 did what is it that you all did on on jobs in the construction arena oh i mean i have a, a background and basis in stick framing so mm -hmm. custom homes in the slopes of bell colorado um from the swamps of new orleans louisiana <laughs> yeah. sounds like you a know? song <laughs> i built homes in a small subdivision um family-owned subdivision in virginia but, you know, I've, I've done a little bit of everything, renovation work, 
and uh, mostly mostly framing. And, and you manage some framing crews too. So I mean, and yeah. How did how do you manage expectations of people showing up to jobs? Well, communication, you know, is and pay pay on a regular basis because I can tell you if the the pay's not there, the crew walks off the job. Well, you, you gotta know, know how to delayed. line it up. I mean, you gotta know how to line it up because if you get it's a fine line. Well, yeah, yeah because if I get my electrician in there first and my electrician runs wires you know horizontally through my studs to get to what he needs to do and then my plumber comes in and realizes i've got to put a vent through the event stack through this wall and his wiring's in my way yeah so to your point it's not just double downs of well shit now i gotta call my plumber back or my electrician back and pay him again to come out because i as the project manager didn't get things done in the well and it's a respect thing too like uh it's not just about hey we said this is the schedule and we'll pay you on the schedule but it's knowing that you're not wasting your plumber's time by him showing up in that being a situation, which goes back to what you were saying about experience and knowing how to get from the beginning of the job to the end, uh, in a, in a way that they have a respect for you because you're respecting their time too. So that's part of it. But from what I've learned and from my experience, you know, if you're doing new construction or a full gut renovation, get your HVAC in there get all your duct work ran, get your unit where it's going to go. And then get your plumber in there and let him do all of his plumbing stuff and get him where he needs to go. And then your electrician to come in last because your electrician can pull wires wherever Around needs anything. To. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, plumbers have to go where plumbers have to go and the HVAC has to go where they have to go. And your trade partners are going to want to show up to a job where they know when they get there, everything's good and they can work. Just Not where they to have it. to call you and say, hey, this was done, this was done, I can't do Because that's a waste of their time. Time is so literally money Some of it's on you providing a job site that, that's ready that for them. is ready that's for them. Ready. Yeah, that's true. Time is money for, for trade partners. 100%. I mean, uh, 100%. They don't want to have to come in and do your demo work or finish framing a wall because your framer didn't put this or that there. I mean, that kind of they stuff. They want to come in, do their trade, and, and go out. to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what they want to do, which which if you manage it right, that's what everybody needs to want them to do. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's always things. There's yeah. overlap. You want there's them to overlap. There's small things. Right. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, and as you, you know. go from, from new construction startup to... to you know, rough end to finish. I mean, there's phases where things overlap, yeah. but there's still orders of the yeah. chaos. I mean, you know, and I think that's where a contractor is just, you don't understand the scheduling behind the sheetrock guys got to be here before the electrical guy, the, the, you know, this has to be done before that. And that's where a lot of people would Valley, the house that we're renovating right now. I mean, the guy had an awesome vision he the guy has execute. the plans. The guy had everything that he needed. He couldn't do it. He couldn't execute it. He couldn't yeah. handle that. Yeah. He was so overwhelmed. That the gap between vision and execution with construction is a very fine line. Yeah. I mean, that's – and it comes down to a lot of stuff in the middle and a lot of organization in the middle that just isn't very fun and entertaining to get to that end result that's fun yeah. to look at and a product that's fun to look at and sell. It's a lot of monotony uh, and a lot of management. hmm so let me ask you this. Uh, we're very excited to have you back in the office. Obviously, we have some pretty big plans for doing some specs um, and things along those lines. But outside of that, you have a ton of experience as a custom home builder. We have a lot of clients that have even inquired um, you know, about building a home on a lot. Somebody wants to build a home. What do they do to contact you? What does that process look like? Give us the plug. Well, generally, uh, when they have a vision... You know, the first thing is to design a product, you know, either from an existing set of plans that we have available or uh, sometimes a custom drawn yeah. set of plans. First, to put that vision on paper that we can all agree on, the, the homeowner and the contractor. Uh, oh, I want a extra bathroom here. I want another bedroom. I want this. I want the master in the front or the master in the back. You have to work through those design decisions. And and that, it's a process because the owners, you know, it's a personal thing. It's getting and, that vision on the paper and uh, then you executing it. Yeah, just execute it. And, and you may go through different changes. Uh, now, it's on a custom job, you know, that usually involves a, a design partner. You yeah. Know, an, an architect that that does all that first phase with the client. Uh, but having experience so many years in the area, sometimes the clients come to me first 
and you help and i can them. direct them to a, a trade partner yeah. that's right. architect or makes yeah. sense yeah you can um, connect the dots to those pieces yeah. that it might be difficult for them to put together on the outset of building a home um, yeah even if they even if we have a spec home that, that we've built and we, you know we will have some in the new year you know the the family may walk through a dozen and a half homes that are different before they find the one that feels right. Yeah, yeah, correct. Um, well, we can start it all at what? McKelveyHomes.com? Yep, McKelveyHomes.com. Other social media. Facebook. Facebook. 850-740-9113. Correct. Direct phone number. Uh, you know, we can start those all right here at 2303 West 19th Street. Yeah, so listen. Uh, if Got um, the connections people looking to build a home they're looking for a lot to buy we can help them with that you're looking for some architecture partners and a general contractor partner he can help with that and we're also going to we're very very excited that we're in the works of starting to build some spec homes and some inventory of some uh what we would call houses priced right for this area very nice very well built houses that are priced affordable for the area so that families can have a nice home to live in and that's something that we're you know, even with our flips, we're, we're pretty passionate about, uh, you know, buying properties, right? And not over finishing so we can give people an affordable product. Affordable home that you can make yours, but your mechanicals are going to be in order. Your sticks are going to be framed properly. Your roof is your roof is going to be square. Your walls are going to be flush and, and you can come and do all of the cosmetic decorations that you envision for yourself. But you're going to be under a roof that is protected and stable for you and your family. Exactly. Quality is not dependent on cost. Correct. Yes. And that's, I think that's a huge statement right there. That's exactly what we try to go for in all our businesses. And we can vouch that we know that is 100% true um, for you and your business. So again, McKelveyHomes.com, social media, reach out to one of us. But if you're looking to build a home, um, if we know somebody looking to build a home, you got your guy right here in Bay County. Um, we're excited to have you with us. Great. Thank so you. Let's take a really quick minute to talk about a couple things in real estate right now, how we end every episode. Um, because of course we're, no matter what facet we're talking about, wholesaling, retail building, it is the real estate industry. Um, so a couple things that we have going on that are hot topics. Obviously we have interest rates. We have the NAR lawsuit. Um, you know, there's a lot of things shaking up and changing. And then, you know, the market is down 40% nationally. Um, I would just make one overbearing statement to all of us without getting into details of these things. You have a lot of things changing in the industry, a lot of forces at work with the general economy. What are you doing to stay optimistic and stay motivated? And how do you stay realistic and honest with your clients at the same time? Um, I would say for me, it's just about being transparent and not pretending the market isn't it's something it's not. You know, when people, I don't want to go on social media or having conversation uh, conversations with people in person and say, hey, this is a great time to buy because X, X, and X. It's a great time to sell because X, X, and X. I try to base everything on an individual basis of where you're at. Um, there's solutions that we can provide. There's things that we can do. Um, but I want to make sure I'm consulting people honestly because we all know the market is tough right now. And uh, it's that belief for me that I know things are get better always. It's roller coaster rides and it's how to stay resilient um, in the down times. And to be honest, I've had to look introspectively and really challenge myself on how we do things and operate things. And I've become better and I'm becoming better, not where I need to be. But we're becoming better real estate professionals no matter which thing we're doing because we're willing to stick it out through the tough time and figure it out till the roller coaster goes up again. So I'm almost finding myself kind of appreciative of it because uh, a pause um, and, a, and a fine tuning is appropriate sometimes even if it's difficult to go through. Um, what about you guys? Uh, I mean, I would say just through my whole career, but especially now, is setting those expectations. People always have a vision, a dream, a hope, a wish. A desire you know that their property might be worth this but you have to be brutally honest in a sensitive caring way to explain to people that's not the reality of where we are right now you can dream all you want and it's great to have dreams but you also have to be rooted and grounded in what's real what's tangible and the segment of real estate I deal with people are in difficult choices you know circumstances and they have to make those difficult choices 
whether it's a, a medical issue, a, a, um, you know, a family dynamic, a financial issue. Um, but the great thing about us is we offer solutions. We are truly here helping people get out of these difficult situations in it with a sensitive, caring approach, which has been successful and is resonating. Um, but it is a, a difficult time to make difficult choices, but we offer solutions. And yep. I, I pride myself in that every single day. Yep. Consistency Agreed. and the communication. Um, like you said, it's a tough market. There's no way to get around that, and there's no way to beat that bush. Uh, you can try it. You can hype it up and make it what it's not. Um, but real estate is one of those things where if the motivation is there and you truly understand your client's why and what their goals are, um, you can find a solution for them. Some people have to move up market, down market, good market, bad market. Some people's jobs move them. It's a smaller percentage some people, of people, but Some people there. are having twins. They didn't think it was going to be twins, and it's twins, uh, you know, or, or whatever that situation got is. Got a mother-in-law moving in with them. They've got family moving in. They've got sick parents that they got to take care of. I mean, those things happen, and if you can truly find those people, have that real conversation with them, and help them understand the options on the table, real estate is still happening, um, but – you know, maybe it's not happening like it was two years ago where people are just writing a contract from California and never seeing the property. That was fun while it lasted. Yeah. Um, but that's not reality. That's not reality. That was two years of reality. And I think that people who got into the industry and, and partially me included, I was in a different industry in 2018, but um, I think this is more of what real estate really is. Yeah, this is a normalized market. I mean, obviously rates aren't great, but... Eight percent historically is, I mean, it's not crazy. It's not, and it's not great. It's but it's not as bad as it's been before. And we and got through those thing markets too, as well. Is, um, you know, the reality is, is there's less deals. But like even our business coach, what does he always tell us? There are deals happening though. Yeah. Why aren't you doing them? It's not that there's no deals. If there was no deals and you were sitting here complaining, that's one thing, right? But there are deals happening. So there's less deals happening. How do you find ways to get in front of those people and be competitive? The old way, you can't pay for leads right now. That doesn't work. You, you, you can't just send out a mail or do general marketing. I, I would I would challenge people, are you on the phones? Consistency are you in the grassroots conversations. Are you door knocking? Are you doing the connection. very simple things? Uh, are you still spending some more money on uh, awareness marketing? But you can't just sit back and, 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 and sell houses uh, that fall out of a tree like someone calls you show house and sells. That's not it. So you you have to find a way to put yourself in a position to find those deals that are happening as difficult as it may be. Um, and I would challenge even, you know, if you don't feel like making cold calls, I mean, two of the listings we have right now, three actually, even our commercial listing uh, mm -hmm. came from a cold call. Yeah. Um, if, if you don't want to get on the phones and you don't want a cold call, it's probably not the industry for you 90% of the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and the, the good news to a degree is that, um, you know, I was reading an article last week and they were talking about how home sales are generally down and the market's down. And even though prices sold on new homes are down, like the actual purchase price is down, mm -hmm. uh, it's about 17% higher year over year people purchasing new homes. Because with interest rates so high and builders actually being able to offer incentives and a much nicer home for a more reasonable price people are being pushed into new builds versus resales, um, which is actually a, a great news for the spec house. If you can build it affordable and get your numbers right, you know that you know people buying them is, is, is going to take place in a relatively quick time because people still need homes, um, but they might need that a builder incentive. They might need um, something that's more reliable um, that they know they can live in for a long time if they're going to be paying an 8% rate. Yep. You know. So anyway, that's... Uh, Appreciate you being here with us. We're really happy to have you in the office. Looking forward to see like the stuff that you have going on new build wise, even outside of us and, and getting some projects going. Um, and that's episode two of It's Personal, an entrepreneur's podcast with Kurt, Andrew, Mike. And we appreciate you being here with us. Um, and our next episode, we're going to be interviewing Alan Branch, who I like to refer to as the Bruce Wayne of Panama City. Um, and also a latter mayoral candidate. So we'll be having him on here. You definitely want to tune in oh, for yeah. that one. That's going to be a really good one. Um, appreciate you being here again. That's it for episode, episode two. Thank you, Kurt. Thanks, Michael.